Jumana K. Roos. You've seen her images on giant billboards across the metro. Jumana K. Roos. You've seen her images on buses across the city. Now get to know Jumana K. Roos. The war broke out in my home country, Lebanon. I was 11 years old and I saw a lot of bloodshed and inequality and poverty. You can't grow up in an environment like that and not be affected by it and not want to make a difference. I graduated from Yale University with a master's in ethics. I speak four languages. It has always been innate in me fighting for the underdog and trying to do whatever it is I can to make a difference in the world. Let Jumana Kairos protect your rights. Call the law offices of Jumana Kairos at 1-866-YOUR Rights Extension 100 or visit yourrights.com. مكاتب المحامية جمانة كيروس تتمنى لكم السلامة في ظل انتشار وباء كوفيد 19. المحامية جمانة كيروس مثلت على مدى 22 عاما ضحايا حوادث السيارات مع طاقم من المحامين ذوي الخبرة وحصلت لموكليها على تعويضات بمئات الملايين من الدولارات قبل أن تختار المحامي الذي سيدافع عن قضيته دقق في تاريخه المهني ومع مكاتب جمانة كيروس تنذهل بآراء مئات الموكلين وخبراتهم الإيجابية في جوجل ريفيوز مكاتب المحامية جمانة كيروس يتحدثون لغتك العربية والكلدانية 248-557-3645 والاستشارة مجانية برنامج يور رايتس مع المحامية جمانة كيروس المختصة في قضايا حوادث السيارات مع نغبة من المحامين في اختصاصات عدة منها الطلاق والهجرة والإفلاس يأتيكم الآن على الهواء مباشرة أحباء المستمعين في كل مكان أهلا بكم في حلقة جديدة من برنامج الرئيس مع المحامية جمانة كيروز وموضوع الحلقة اليوم عن قضايا الإفلاس بإمكانكم المشاركة في البرنامج على الأرقام 313-769-6666-519-256-123 ودائما عن طريق الواتساب والرقم هو 313-327-7074 بإمكانكم الحصول على استشارات مجانية في القضايا التي يتعامل معها مكتب المحامية جمانة كيروز وهي قضايا الإصابات الشخصية من ضمنها حوادث السيارات، إصابات العمل، الأخطاء الطبية، قضايا الهجرة والتجنس، قضايا الفلاس، قضايا ضمان الاجتماعي وقوانين العائلة رقم الهاتف هو 248-557-3645 ننوه مستمعينا بأن حلقات برنامج رايت دائما نبثها على اليوتيوب بإمكانكم الرجوع إليها مرة أخرى والاستماع إليها لكل من فاتته فرصة الاستماع إلى البرنامج على الهواء مباشرة كل ما عليكم هو زيارة قناة جمانة كيروس على اليوتيوب تحياتنا لكم جمانة مساء الخير ونرحب بك في برنامج الرايت مساء النور رامي يعطيك العافية كيفك اليوم الحمد لله الله يعافيك بخير إن شاء الله أنت تكونين بخير خير الله بهنهار الجميل والمشمس مساء الخير لكل المستمعين مثل كل نهار جمعة نحكي عن قانون الهجر قانون الإفلاس مع المحامي مايكل بانكستين Good afternoon attorney مايكل بانكستين How are you today? I'm great Jumana How are you doing today? Very good Very good um, Thank you for joining us Michael Like every Friday um, We will take your questions Your comments um, The numbers to call are 313-769-6666 313-327-7074 is if you want to send us a question off the air. And uh, in this uh, show, we often get questions uh, on the radio WhatsApp number. Again, that number is 313-327-7074. Um, there were a couple of things that we wanted to talk about last Friday. We did not have a chance to talk about them. So I want to talk about them today, too. We've spoken about that a couple of times before on the radio a little while ago. Uh, bankruptcy or divorce, what should come first in an ideal situation? And let's talk about that generally first. And then let's talk about when a, when a husband and a wife or, or civilly married people, husband, husband, wife and wife, Civilly married people, uh, when when they're facing bankruptcy, should one file, should both file? When is a good idea when one should file? When is a good idea when both should jointly file? So first, the general idea of bankruptcy and divorce in an ideal world. What should come first, in your opinion? Thank you, Jumana. In my opinion, generally speaking, the bankruptcy should come first. And here's Tell why. 
Oops, sorry. And here's why. Because that's one less thing to fight about in the divorce court. Uh, because one of the things that's dealt with in divorce court is what do you do with the debt? How do you allocate who should pay what uh, in terms of, of debts? You can get rid of the debt in bankruptcy, and that's one less thing to fight about in the divorce court. Okay, so generally speaking, if a couple is experiencing financial problems and maybe uh, heading for bankruptcy, in an ideal situation, file the bankruptcy, discharge as many debts as you can. This way, when you file for divorce later, there is less debt to fight over who is going to pay, and there, there are less issues your lawyer and your spouse's lawyer are going to have to fight over, especially who has to pay what. So that's in an ideal situation. What if the, the relationship is so sour between the couple that uh, they, they, um, they don't, uh, they, they do, one of them does not want to file jointly with the other, that person cannot be forced, right? That's correct. In life, you can't always control the timing. Uh, there's a difference between the ideal and, and what sometimes happens, particularly in the context of a divorce. Somebody may file a divorce uh, while you're still in bankruptcy, or maybe you're about to file for bankruptcy, or they say they don't want to be involved in the bankruptcy, and that's okay. Even if you're married, um, when people are married, they have the option of filing a joint bankruptcy, but you aren't required to file jointly with your spouse. Even if you're married, you have the ability to file for bankruptcy individually. In other words, you cannot force your spouse uh, significant other to file jointly with you that either on, on board because they understand you know that this may be a good thing for the two of you later in a divorce or they're not on board and you cannot force them that's correct okay awwal naqta am nahki anna awqat bikun couple mutazawijin rajul aw imra'a aw rajul aw rajul aw imra'a aw imra'a bi hal iyam zawaj civil marriage civil union not not religious marriage على فكرة civil marriage uh, أوقات بيكون القبل عندهم مشاكل مادية ويمكن قادمين على الطل على الطلاء وقادمين على الإفلاس السؤال اللي بيطرح السؤال اللي بيطرح نفسه هو شو لازم يكون بالأول ب ب ب ب بالحياة المثالية مثاليا ideally هل لازم هذا القبل يقدم بانكربسي قبل أو يقدم الديفورس قبل؟ منعرف اثنيناتهم اللي حيصيروا سلم جدلاً أنه اثنيناتهم اللي حيصيروا أي الأحسن؟ قاعدة عامة اللي أحسن واللي أحسن بكتير هو البانكربسي بالأول والديفورس بعدين لأنه إذا, 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 إذا القبل قدم الديفورس بالأول عندهم كتير ديون بدون يتخانقوا عبر المحاميين تبعون على مين بدو يتحمل أي دين وهذا بيطول الطلاق وبيصعب الطلاق وإنما إذا قدموا البانكربسي تبعون بالأول إن كان individually أو jointly ومنحكي قريبا من بعد البريك أي ما تلازم couple يقدم individually وأي ما تلازم couple يقدم jointly but لنقول استشاروا محامي إفلاس واستشاروا محامي طلاق واقتنعوا انه لازم الافلاس يتم قبل الطلاق. ساعتها كل الديون اللي بيقدروا يتخلصوا منها بالافلاس، اذا قدموا الافلاس بالاول اللي بيتخلصوا منها بيرجعوا بعدين بيقدموا طلاقهم، وقت اللي بيقدموا طلاقهم وقت اللي بيقدموا طلاقهم وقت اللي بيقدموا طلاقهم الأمور بتصير هينة أكتر يعني ما بيعود عندهم كتير إيشوز تو ديسكس رامي أنا بعرف الكاميرا مفتوحة بس ما بعرف سكرها بصراحة <تصفيق> ولا هي مجمع <تصفيق> آم، نعم so, آم، بركي وقت لما ناخد بريك رامي إذا بتسمح ترجع تطلبني إذا هيدا ممكن يكون sure. might be good idea <تصفيق> نعم <تصفيق> so, كقاعة عامة إذا الإنسان قدم بانكربسي قبل بتهون الامور بالطلاق من انه يقدم الطلاق لانه الطلاق ما بتمحي شيء 
الطلاق بس بتحمل مسؤولية على طرف أو على الطرفين أو على الطرف الآخر so, أحسن الواحد يفوت بالطلاق والأشياء مسهلة أكثر من أنه هو يكون العكس آه خلينا ناخد وقفة سريعة ومنجاوب اتصال الاستاذ جميل أو سؤال الاستاذ جميل اللي بيقول Will I lose my property if I file bankruptcy استاذ جميل إذا ممكن توضح لنا أولا أي, أي, أي bankruptcy هل حضرتك بدك تقدم chapter 7 أو بدك تقدم chapter 13 هل أنت مؤهل لchapter 7 والproperty شو هي هل عم تحكي عن بيتك عم تحكي عن مورجج نحن بحاجة لهالتفاصيل لنقدر نجاوب بطريقة مفصلة على سؤالك بناخد وقفة سريعة ونرجع منعود مكتب المحامية جمانة كيروز يعلن عن استقبال الموكلين والمراجعين في العنوان الجديد 24370 North Western Highway Southfield على مسافة قريبة من موقع المكتب القديم مكتب المحامية جمانة كيروز يتعامل مع كافة قضاياكم المتعلقة بالإصابات الشخصية من ضمنها حوادث السيارات إصابات العمل الأخطاء الطبية بالإضافة إلى قضاء الهجرة والتجنس الإفلاس الضمان الاجتماعي وقوانين العائلة والاستشارات مجانية 248-557-3645 هل أنت مضطر إلى إشهار إفلاسك؟ لا تخذ هذه تجربة لوحدك بل استشر أولا ومجانا مكاتب المحامية جمان كيروس وتكلم مع المحامي المختص بقضاء الإفلاس مايكل بنكستين الذي سيساعدك على التخلص من ديونك وفقا للبند السابع لقانون الإفلاس بسعر 575 دولارا فقط ومن الممكن أيضا أن تحصل على إعفاء من أتعاب المحكمة اعتمادا على عدد أفراد الأسرة ومدخولك الشهري اتصل الآن بمكاتب المحامية جمان كيروس 248-557-3645 والاستشارة مجانية Your Rights مع المحامية جمانة كيروس عودة إلى برنامج Your Rights مع المحامية جمانة كيروس وعلى الهواء مباشرة نستقبل اتصالاتكم والأرقام هي في الاستوديو 313-769-6666 5192561023 وبامكانكم المشاركه عن طريق الواتساب 3133277074 جمانه نرجع لك شكرا رامي ما بعرف اذا جمانه تسمعينا يبدو انه فقدنا الاتصال مع جمانه والمحامي مايكل بنكستين واكيد هو مختص بقضايا الافلاس جمانه تسمعي ما بدي اجاوب على السؤال بدنا نعرف شوي نعم عفوا انقطع الاتصال للحظات ورجع مره اخرى فنعتذر ما سمعنا اذا كان عندك تعليق جمانه نعم عم تسمعني هلا نعم نسمعك تفضل <تصفيق> نعم الاستاذ جميل بعث لنا سؤال لنقدر نجاوب عليه بدنا نعرف بالتحديد إذا هو يقدم تشابتر 7 أو تشابتر 13 نعرف تقريبا كمية كل إنسان تقريبا كل إنسان تشابتر 7 فيري جود تاني سؤال هو هل البروبرتي تبعك هي يور مورجج هوم عم بتحاول تحافظ على المورجج شو قصدك بالبروبرتي تبعك أوكي فيري جود مورجج هوم هل أنت مأخر على البيمنتس نتصور يس yes. البيت تبعك يا ريت بتأكد لنا ار يو بيهايند اون يور Mortgage payments for your home. Attorney Michael Bankstein, we have a question from someone who is um, going, I suppose, to file for Chapter 7 or qualifies for Chapter 7 and is concerned. Okay, the answer is no. He's not behind on his home mortgages, mortgage payment. If he files Chapter 7, will he lose his home? Michael? In the Chapter 7. There's a certain amount of equity that you can protect in your home. Um, when you take the value of the home and you subtract whatever you owe on the home, be it a mortgage or a second mortgage or a home equity line of credit, the amount you have left over is the equity. There's a certain amount of equity that you can protect in a Chapter 7. So one of the things that I do when I meet with someone initially and they have a home and they want to file a Chapter 7 bankruptcy is one of the first things we do is make sure, is the home safe? Is it within the amount of equity that you can protect? Generally speaking, can you, there's a... Yes. Sorry. There's a... Remind us of the state, yes. I'm sorry? Go ahead, please. Yes, I was going to tell you, please remind the listeners again about how much equity, if, if, you, if you take advantage of the state exemption, 
how much equity if you take advantage of the federal exemption? Yes, uh, it's twenty five thousand uh, dollars for the federal exemption. There's a Michigan exemption of forty thousand dollars if you're under the age of sixty five and you're not disabled. Um, if you're sixty five years or older uh, and it's your residence and either you or one of your dependents who lives in the house with you is disabled, then that forty thousand dollar amount flips up to sixty thousand dollars. Mr. Jamil, from listening to attorney Michael Bankstein, I think you and the listeners can tell that bankruptcy is not straightforward. It's not a do-it-yourself kind of thing. And there are no answers that apply to everybody. It is really a case-by-case situation. That is why listening to this program and other programs that talk about bankruptcy is very helpful because little by little we can start, you know, breaking down concepts and, and, and making it easier and easier. But it is by no means a guide or a final answer to your situation. So it all depends what you want to do. Do you want to keep your home? You don't want to keep your home. How much, how many exemptions, how much equity do you have in your home? Can you take advantage of the exemptions? Will that be sufficient? You might not then at the end of the analysis, when you when you meet with an experienced bankruptcy attorney, the conclusion may be that you do not or should not apply for Chapter 7 and save your home, but you should apply for Chapter 13. Correct, Michael? That's correct. Okay. So, again, you know, um, our discussions definitely broaden everybody's horizons about bankruptcy, the final nuances. Uh, but it's never intended to be a substitute for a one-on-one consultation between everyone and, you know, if a, an experienced lawyer. You just reminded me in preparing for the show today, Michael, that you've always said it takes two to four years of, of struggling on your own financially, of trying to figure it out, of trying to patch things up of living in denial before you head to a bankruptcy attorney. And it often takes truly a precipitating factor, like a notice of foreclosure or something like that, for you to, you know, come running to a bankruptcy lawyer. Have you found that to be across ethnicities, across across races, across genders, this hesitation at coming and consulting with a um, with a bankruptcy attorney, this two to four years time where people are suffering psychologically and emotionally before they decide to go to a lawyer? I have not noted any difference in that across genders, ethnicities, what have you. And I've I've helped all walks of life. Uh, through bankruptcy. And I can tell you, it's a, it's a near universal. Uh, nobody is uh, jumping for joy about um, having to file for bankruptcy. And people really have gotten to the point where they've exhausted every other possibility or perceived possibility before you get that triggering factor that, that finally kind of puts someone over the edge and says, I can't do this alone anymore. I've, I've been treading water for two, three, four years I've got to go have that consultation. You don't have to wait four years to do it. It's always better to do it earlier rather than later if you think you're getting into that kind of a situation. But I understand people's reluctance to uh, to talk about these kind of things. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. Let's go back to the question of uh, spouses in a civil marriage. So those who are religiously married but not civilly married, are not considered under the bankruptcy code for the purposes of filing for bankruptcy, are not considered spouses. When we say spouses, it can be husband and wife, wife and wife, husband and husband, as long as it is a civil union. A religious union is not recognized in the bankruptcy code as a marriage, correct? That is correct. Okay. Next question. Civil union, the question becomes, and we get that all the time, should I file 
Should both of us file? Should we each file separately, individually? Should, should we both file jointly? Can you tell us what the guiding rule of thumb on this is? Yes, the rule of thumb is I look to see um, for each spouse, how much debt does that spouse have? If you have a situation where, uh, this is an exaggerated example, but if you have uh, a case where one spouse has $50,000 worth of debt and the other spouse has, I don't know, $1 or $2,000 worth of debt, then you've got to think, okay, I could be in the case too and, and get rid of the $2,000 worth of debt. But it is a fact that there is a temporary effect on the credit score by virtue of filing for bankruptcy. In a situation like that, it makes sense to get rid of the $50,000, but but maybe you'd have that person file as an individual and have the spouse who only has a couple of thousand dollars worth of debt. That's that's manageable over time. Keep a good credit score so that if you need to buy something later, you can do that. OK, so we do have a caller. Let's return to this issue, because, again, we get faced with that question all the time. But let's not make him wait too long. And then we will return to this issue because we're not quite done analyzing Civilly married people, do you file together or does only one file so that the other person can spare and save her or his credit score? Estes Abdullah, you are on the air. Hello. Hello, marhaba. Ya ahla wa sahla. Ya ahla istadi, ya ahla wa sahla. Allah ya afiq. أنا عندي مشكلة في الكريدت كانت زوجتي تستعمل الكريدت يعني صار يمكن علي ممكن اوفر 200000 بس اخر مره استعملت الكريدت 2018 عندي بيت بي اوف عندي سيارات فاذا سويت البنك رقصي اسمح لي بس اقطعك دقيقه كريدت كاردز عليا 7 او 8000 دولارز لا ممكن 100 اوفر 100000 اوكي الكريدت كاردز باسمك باسم زوجتك ولا باسمكم الاثنين؟ باسمي ولكن هي اللي كانت يعني تستخدم الكريدت هي شيز امريكان فروم ميشن كانت تستخدم الكريدت وما كانت تدفع يعني. Is she a co a co signer on the on the credit card or is the credit card only yours? لا only me. Okay. وعندك سيارة وبيت؟ عندي سيارتين وعندي بيت كله بي اوف يعني على اندر ماي نيم يعني هي مو معي بالاشياء كومبليتلي بيد اوف؟ يس كومبليتلي اوكي فري اند كلير يس نو مورجج نو لين نو 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 لافين Okay, you have two cards, you have a home free and clear, but you have a credit card that used by your wife, but really only in your name, exceeding $100,000. Yeah, maybe more. What's the value of your home? Uh -huh. What's the value of your home? Uh, maybe 60000 What is your question, Mr. Abdullah? يعني أنا بيسوي بنكربسي لأني أنا تعبان الناس بعد يجوني على البيت يقولوا لي الكورت والكورت والكورت يعني امبيرسيك ويحطوا البيبر على على الدور وي تيك بيكتشر فروم ذا نيبر يعني أبي أخلص من هذا الموضوع يعني. Okay, Mr. Abdullah, do you have any debt other than this credit card? Is there anything else that you want to discharge? لا بس الـ بس الكريدت. Okay. So يعني last time I used the credit card 2018. Okay, and it is only one credit card? No, it's uh, too many credit cards. Okay, it's several credit cards. And when you say somebody is stacking things on your door, are you being served by the court, you think? Yeah, by the court they come like uh, each credit card they send someone uh, to come uh, to the house, you know. Well, it's a credit card and not send somebody to the house. It must be, and correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, Attorney Michael Bankstein. It must be that you've been sued and trying to serve you, 
and they they are not serving the person. Yeah, so yeah. They got maybe that, but served. I don't know. You know, I don't know that. You know, yeah. um, that's oh. what they say. You know, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it sounds to so me like a lawsuit has been for... filed, and they're trying to serve him. Okay, so so it looks like he's being served by multiple credit card companies. The question for him, Michael, he wants to get rid of his debt. And he wants to know uh, if he can file bankruptcy. The issue with him is he has over $100,000 in multiple credit cards. Uh, last choose in 2018, but he had a home free and clear for $60,000. Can he file for bankruptcy? Ideally, everyone wants to file for Chapter 7 because then the whole debt will be gone. But can he do that, given that he has a home and not his home? My question to him is, is he the only one on the deed or is his spouse also on the deed with him to the home? Uh, I have I have some. Uh, some uh, I add her one. Some is all mine. But it's the most is mine, you know. No, no, no. I think you misunderstood. El bait. هل هو مية بالمية باسمك ولا في حدا تاني على التايتل؟ لا بس مكتوب يعني ميريت. I don't know if that that means I have someone with me, but it's with my name under my name. Okay. هل محطوط باسمك a married person ولا محطوط باسمك واسم مرتك؟ لا لا. شو ترايس؟ اسمي. يا بس اسمي وحطي لي ميريت. بعدين لما اتصل فيهم بكتب ليش حطي لي ميريت؟ يعني how you know I am married or not? You know. Uh, they say we have to to put something, you know. But sure. yeah, I did change that, you know. But it says in my name, but it says marriage, yeah. Okay. The title, the deed to his home states in his name, a married person. I'm so glad that you mentioned that and that this came up today and that he called because that is a source of confusion I've heard over the years. On a deed in Michigan, even if you're the only one on the deed, if you're married, it'll say what your marital status is. You know, such and such a person, a married man, such and such a person, uh, a single woman. Uh, the fact that it says that you're married or you're single, uh, that's just the way it's worded on a deed in, in the state of Michigan. Um, that's not the same thing as it being jointly titled. If, uh, if Mr. and Mrs. Exactly. Smith are on a deed, it's going to say Mr. Smith, a married man, and Mrs. Smith, a married woman. So if your wife's name is not on that deed, then it sounds like it may be just titled in your name, even though it makes reference to you being a married man. They, uh, they, they added the title married. I didn't say or they didn't ask me. When I, when I received the paper, I called them. I said, why you put married? I, did, I, you know, I didn't say I married or not. But I didn't change the sense, you know. Uh, in fact, right, the important thing is, your name, if it were in his name and his wife's name, it will not only say his name and his wife's name. I think it will also add the magical language with joint rights of survivorship, meaning if one passes, the other person uh, inherits the home 100 percent. Yeah, see, the, the bankruptcy court doesn't distinguish between um, I don't want to use too much jargon, but there is, you know, entireties versus jointly titled. But. But if, if he's the only one on the deed, then he's the only owner. Anybody who's on the deed, um, who's actually an owner of the house, their name will be on that deed. So if your wife's name is not on that deed, then she doesn't own the house along with you. That's a critical issue, and I'll tell you why. If you and your wife are on the house, and you, let's say you're just the one filing for bankruptcy, you got a $60,000 house that's paid in full. But if you're on the deed and she's on the deed, they're only looking at your one half interest in the equity, which would be thirty thousand dollars, which is within the amount that you could exempt using the Michigan exemption, which we said earlier in the show is forty thousand. If it turns out that you're the only one on the deed and you're not disabled and nobody in the house is disabled and you're under the age of sixty five, then you're a good twenty thousand dollars over the amount that you could protect in a Chapter 7. So that's a really critical issue. Uh, you would definitely want to get a really good look at that deed. Yeah, but so, um, really, I don't know how much it's my my house is worth exactly. You know, I just say, you know, you know, I pay less than amount, you know, 2013. 
like I pay maybe uh, uh, thirteen thousand for entire the house. Uh, it was uh, uh, hard from the bank, and then I think the house is uh, in the neighborhood itself for sixty, seventy, eighty thousand. But I don't know exactly how much my house. Is. One of the things I do at a consultation, at an initial consultation, is we try to get a really good sense of what is the house worth. Um, because uh, we wouldn't want to file you as a Chapter 7 if okay. uh, if that would put your house in danger. Uh, okay. Can I, can I come and uh, talk with you in person? Uh, absolutely. Do you have a pen? Let's give you the yes. phone number. Are you, yes. uh, you have a pen? Yes. The phone number is 248-557-3645. Okay. And you can ask to speak with the bankruptcy department, and they'll absolutely put you on the schedule for a free consultation. Okay. And your your name, Mike? My name is Michael Bankstein. I'm the managing attorney of the bankruptcy department here at the law offices of Jumana K. Bruce. Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, and thank you, uh, thanks uh, for Diana and uh, Mr. Rami. I look forward to speaking thank with you, sir. Shukran, Estes Abdullah. Um, Abdullah is a good example of someone who needs to file for bankruptcy, but is worried about losing his home. Uh, chapter seven may not be the right solution for him because there is so much he can get credit for called an exemption. If the value, if the fair market value, it doesn't matter, and correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, it doesn't matter what he bought it for. It matters what the fair market value of the home is today, right? Correct, yes, present right. value. Present value. So he could have bought it for forty, and if it's now $75,000, $75,000 is what he's looking at. And if on one hand he has a hundred, hundred twenty thousand dollars in credit card debt, on the other hand he has sixty thousand dollar value, he might not qualify for Chapter Seven because the bankruptcy trustee will say, "You have seventy thousand dollars of equity in your home, and you want to file for bankruptcy. We'll force you to sell that home, take that money, and repay your debtors." But Chapter Thirteen then may be a solution for him. Correct. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, chapter 13 process uh, could very well uh, you know, fit for him. That's why a, a good, robust initial consultation is so vital to, to come up with not a one-size-fits-all response, but something that's really tailored to, um, to a person's particular facts and, and what they're looking to do. And let's assume that he will be a candidate for Chapter 13 because he wants to save his home and he has too much equity in it. Um, what happens to that $100,000, $120,000 in multiple credit card debts? Well, in a Chapter 13, unlike a Chapter 7, in a Chapter 7, you typically pay nothing to, to those, those kind of creditors. Right. In a Chapter 13, you pay... I'm sorry. In a Chapter 7, the whole hundred hundred and twenty thousand dollars debt will be gone. In a Chapter 13, not all of it will be gone. Yeah, you pay what you're able to pay over some period of time in a Chapter 13. So this is when the judge will take a look at, say, Mr. Abdullah's income, Mr. Abdullah's expenses, how much money he has left at the end of the month, use that money. Let's say he has $800 left at the end of every month after he pays his, you know, major expenses and all of that, then $800 $800 is what the judge uses to repay some of this hundred and $120,000 back to the multiple credit card companies over three to five years, right? That's correct. That's a major factor. They also look at how much you're over the equity exemption. Okay. So if you're, if you're $10,000 over the equity exemption, uh, you know you'd have to pay at least $10,000 to the creditors over some period of time. So, so that's, that's but a, a major factor is if you're over the equity exemption and that's why you're doing a 13, you can't pay less to your creditors than you're over that exemption. So, you know, but, but mostly it is, you know, your income and expenses. It's really a mixture of your income, expenses, assets, and liabilities. And they, they put together a percentage. You're going to pay a certain percentage to your unsecured creditors based on those factors.
And we always said that everybody dreams, if they are to file bankruptcy, dreams of filing Chapter 7 because it wipes out all of their debt. But not everybody qualifies for filing Chapter 7 and wipe out all of that debt. The difference for people like Mr. Abdullah would be the difference between the $100,000, $120,000 debt going down to zero in a Chapter 7 versus the $100,000, $120,000 going down to, I don't know, twenty, thirty thousand. 30000 correct? That's correct. Uh, I always try to get someone into a Chapter 7 if I can. That's always my starting point. But if for whatever reason someone doesn't meet one of those conditions you need to meet to be a Chapter 7, then we definitely can transition the conversation over to what does a Chapter 13 look like for you in terms of the length, how much does it look like you're going to pay, that sort of thing. And you've always said, and you reminded me as you were preparing for today's show, Chapter 7, you qualify whoever you are. However, however much money you make, what you spend should be more than what you make. And to qualify for Chapter 7, whoever you are, you have to simply show that the, at the end of the day, at the end of the month, after you make the income you make and you spend the major expenses, we're not talking about a two-week trip to Fiji, we're not talking about going to the restaurant, you know, every week. We're talking about the basic, what do you call them, the everyday expenses? What do you call those? You have a term for those. Your reasonable and necessary expenses, you know, the, the food, the gasoline in your car, um, that kind of thing. Right. Insurance on your car, uh, your, your electrical bill, your cell phone bill. These are reasonable yes. and necessary expenses. So in order for you to know whether you qualify for chapter seven which is what everybody wants because it's a clean slate you have to show that you have to show the judge you have to show the bankruptcy trustee that how much money you bring in every month and how much money you have to spend on your reasonable and necessary expenses every month leaves you with so little money that you're unable to repay your creditors. You use the number like you'd have to be left with less than $300 every month for you to dream of being in Chapter 7, correct? Yeah, my rule of thumb for me specifically is um, generally it's better if you've got less than $75 left at the end of the month. If it starts getting north of 75 you know, you is as 75 becomes 100, if it becomes more than 100, if it's two or 300, it's pretty hard to say that you can't pay anything to your creditors. A chapter seven is based on little or no ability to repay the debts over time. The 13 is based on having some ability to pay your creditors, even if you can't pay them off in full. So I was wrong when I when I used the number. If you're left with $300 at the end of the month, you'll be OK. OK, I do apologize about that. So you'd have to be left with a lot less than that to qualify for a Chapter 7. Uh, yes, yeah. If you had 300 left at the end of the month, they'd say, you know, you can pay something. Um, in fact, one of the common questions that the trustees, there's a trustee appointed by the court to question you at a hearing. One of the things they, they tend to ask is, when you look at all your income and all your expenses at the end of the month, do you think you have more than $200 left? Um, that's not a hard and fast cutoff, but I mean, I would say, I would say if it's more than 200, uh, no way. And probably a hundred to 200, maybe yes, maybe no. If it's, you know, maybe 75 or a hundred or less left at the end of the month, then that's an indication that you have little or no ability to repay the debts over time. Okay. Thank you very much. Going back to the question, by the way, we have another 15, 17 minutes. Anyone who wishes to call or send us a question on bankruptcy, uh, 313-327-7074 is the radio WhatsApp. You can send your questions there or you can call us, 313-769-6666. Going back to a civilly married couple. Uh, not religiously married, because that, that's not recognized as married uh, for the purpose of the bankruptcy code. Uh, a civilly married couple, the question of whether to file jointly or separately, again, you are better off having a consultation because it's not that simple. Of course, the advantages of filing separately or individually is you can save your spouse's credit score, which is awesome. But 
if it defeats the purpose to file individually because your spouse is still left with debt, then you might as well file jointly. What's the point of, say, the husband filing, let's say, the caller, he has a $120,000 credit card debt, and it is in his name and in his wife's name. What is the point of him filing alone? He will be discharged, but now all of it is still on her. So what has he accomplished in a loving, you know, civil union where he does not want to harm his wife? If she is on the credit cards, both need to, to, to file jointly or file so that both are off the hook. One filing does not absolve the responsibility of the other person. But as the caller said, his, his name alone is on the credit card. He was allowing her to use it. So assuming she doesn't have any other debt, let's assume that for a minute, he can file alone. He alone, and putting aside the story of the house for a minute, he, on those credit cards, in this civil marriage that he has with his wife, in this marriage, can file alone and spare her credit score because... Those credit cards are in his name only, and if he qualifies for Chapter 7, for example, that whole debt will be wiped out. So that would be an example of maybe he wants to file individually but not file jointly, correct? That's correct, and that's an excellent observation. Just as though, just as I had everyone who comes in, everyone who I speak with wants to be a Chapter 7, um, and some people can be a chapter seven or not. I also quite frequently will have one of the spouses uh, call me and speak with me. And I only want to be the one in the bankruptcy. I don't want my wife in the bankruptcy. And, and I understand that's what you want. But I do have to ask a few questions about does your spouse have any debt? Because if you and your spouse are uh, jointly on $50,000 worth of credit card debt, well, you absolutely can file as an individual, just like you could can walk out into traffic on 696, but you wouldn't necessarily want to do that. Um, it, you would, if you're the one who files for bankruptcy and your spouse does not, and you're joint on $50,000 worth of credit card debt, the bankruptcy discharge eliminates your legal obligation to pay, but not the legal obligation of a co-debtor who was not in the bankruptcy. So that's one of the things I look at. Does your spouse have any debt? How much? Is it fifty thousand dollars or or one or two thousand dollars? It's very fact specific. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. Um, I learned something so new from you today. I've always thought that Chapter Thirteen is for people who do not qualify for Chapter Seven because they have some ability to repay, and one of their purposes for going into into bankruptcy is to wipe out debts. I learned today something new. You can go into Chapter 13 bankruptcy and be a very, you know, you can have a lot, make a lot of money and be a very high age or wage earner. And you're not necessarily wanting to wipe out any debt, but you are wanting to spread out debt that you owed over three to five years. Let's say you owe the IRS $300,000. And the IRS is not working with you to repay it. You can use Chapter 13 not to wipe that debt, but to ultimately force the government into a payment plan of the $300,000 over three to five years, which would be like $5,000 a month. Let's take a quick break and talk about that. Thank you so much. هل أنت مضطر إلى إشهار إفلاسك؟ لا تأخذ هذه تجربة لوحدك بل استشر أولا ومجانا مكاتب المحامية جمان كيروس وتكلم مع المحامي المختص بقضايا الإفلاس مايكل بنكستين الذي سيساعدك على التخلص من ديونك وفقا للبند السابع لقانون الإفلاس بسعر 575 دولارا فقط ومن الممكن أيضا أن تحصل على إعفاء من أتعاب المحكمة اعتمادا على عدد أفراد الأسرة ومدخولك الشهري اتصل الآن بمكاتب المحامية جمان كيروس 248-557-3645 والاستشارة مجانية مكتب المحامية جمانة كيروز يعلن عن استقبال الموكلين والمراجعين في العنوان الجديد 24370 
نورث ويسترن هايوي ساوثفيلد على مسافة قريبة من موقع المكتب القديم مكتب المحامي جمان كيروس يتعامل مع كافة قضاياكم المتعلقة بالإصابات الشخصية من ضمنها حوادث السيارات إصابات العمل الأخطاء الطبية بالإضافة إلى قضاء الهجرة والتجنس الإفلاس الضمان الاجتماعي وقوانين العائلة والاستشارات مجانية 248-557-3645 مع المحامية جمانة كيروز عودة لبرنامج الرايت مع المحامية جمانة كيروز أرقام الهواتف في الاستوديو 313-769-6666 519-256-1023 دائما على الواتساب 313-327-7074 موضوع الحلقة اليوم عن قضايا الإفلاس جمانة نرجع لك شكرا موضوع وغما رحكينا عنه قبل اغلبية الاوقات الانسان اللي بيقدم بانكرابسي ان كان شابتر 7 او شابتر 13 هو لانه عنده ديون بده يتخلص منها، اذا كان مؤهل لشابتر 7 بيتخلص منها 100% مش هيك كل انسان بيتمنى انه يكون مؤهل لشابتر 7 اذا على على الاقل اذا ما كان مؤهل انه ديونه كلها تروح بيقدم شابتر 13 اللي بتاهله انه يخفض الديون من 100% لشيء يمكن 30 او 40% حسب قدرته يرد المصاري اللي 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 بيوصل مين بينجح انه يقدم شابتر 7 وينعس عن ديونه 100% ومين بيضطر رغم من عنه يقدم شابتر 13 ويرد جزء من المصاري هو قديه بيبقي له مصاري بنهاية الشهر يعني بيطلع بيصرف مصاريف الضرورية إذا بقي له أقل من 75 دولار لح تكون هينة أنه يقدم شابتر 7 وينعفى عن كل شيء مية بالمية إذا كان بين ال 75 وال 200 دولار يمكن إيه يمكن لا من بعد بيقول المحامي عم يحكي كقاعدة عامة هذا الإنسان ما رح يقدر يقدم شابتر 7 وينعفى 100% عن ديونه بس بيقدر يقدم شابتر 13 وينعفى عن 70 80 60% من ديونه حسب قدرته للدفع بآخر الشهر لأنه بيكون عنده قدرة للدفع أكثر من 75 دولار بالشهر وبيقصتهم على 3 إلى 5 سنين اللي ولا مرة حكين عنه هو نادراً بس اوقات استخدام للشابتر 13 مش لننعفى عن ديون لانه في ديون ما بنقدر ننعفى عنها لنقول الضريبه للحكومه الضريبه للستيت الضريبه للانكم تاكس الضريبه للاي ار اس قلنا الجمعه الماضيه انه اي اي انكم تاكس ريتيرن عمره اكثر سوري اي انكم تاكس اي انكم تاكسز عمرهم اكثر من ثلاث سنوات لسنه صاحب الشان كان مقدمه اون تايم بيقدر يقدم افلاسه لينعفى عنها بس لنقول نحن اليوم 2021 وبدنا ننحي بدنا بننحي ديون الانكم تاكس ريتيرن للاي اس او الستيت 2019 هل بنقدر نو لانه ما عمره ثلاث سنين وهل لهذه السنه بالتحديد قدرنا قدمنا الضريبه تبعنا اون تايم يعني الانك... يعني الريتيرنز مش الضريبه كدفع لنقول مثلا شخص بال 2018 او بال 2019 اوفد اي ار اس 300000 دولار ما بيقدروا يدفعون اذا قدم اذا قدم الفلوس هل رح ينعفى عنهم؟ ذا كويشن از نو لانه عمرهم اقل من ثلاث سنوات شو بيقدر يعمل؟ هل بيقدر يستفيد اذا قدم إفلاس. الجواب هو ياس هيدي اليوم أنا اكتشفتها لأول مرة مع أنه صار لنا ثلاث سنوات إذا مش أكثر نطلع على الراديو طريقة تانية في بعض الأشخاص نادرا منهم بس في بعض الأشخاص بيستخدموا تقديم على شابتر 13 لا يجبروا الاي ار اس أو الستيت تدخل معهم ببيمنت بلان على ثلاثة لخمس سنوات يعني هال 300 ألف دولار بيقدموا شابتر 13 بيسترجوا القاضي انه عندهم القدره يدفعون على ثلاثة الى خمس سنوات وبيفوتوا بيمنت بلان مع الاي ار اس او مع الستيت يدفعوا هال 300000 دولار بدل ما يدفعون فرد دفعه او اذا الاي ار اس او الستيت دفعوا رفضوا يعملوا لهم بيمنت بلان ساعتها الطريقه اللي صاحب الامر صاحب الشان بيقدر يجبر الاي ار اس او الستيت يعملوا بيمنت بلان اذا قدم شابتر 13 ما عم بيقدم شابتر 13 لينعفى عن كريدت كارد و و و 
بيقدم تشابتر 13 ليدخل ببيمنت بلان بين ثلاثة لخمس سنين يعني بقصة 300 ألف دولار على ثلاثة لخمس سنين 300 ألف دولار لنقول على خمس سنين يعني 5000 دولار بالشهر إذا قدر يفرج القاضي إنه مدخوله ومن بعد دفعاته الأساسية بيبقى له 5000 دولار أور مور بالشهر القاضي رح يسمح له يقدم تشابتر 13 رح يسمح له يدخل بهالريبيمنت بلان للاي ار اس دفع ال 300000 دولار مش دفعه وحده مش 50000 دولار هير و25000 دولار دير ودائما يعيش بخوف انه يمكن الحكومه تعمل لين على على ممتلكاته بس ناو الاي ار اس او الستيت از باوند مجبوره ان بلان على خمس سنين تقبل منه انه يقطع 300000 دولار على خمس سنين 5000 دولار بالشهر. If someone owes the IRS or the state, say $300,000, assume the debt is younger than three years and forget that exception we talked about last year, cannot pay the IRS. The IRS is not cooperating or he's not able to pay the payment plan that they want him to pay. Can you pay $50,000 here, $25,000 there? This person, if can prove at the end of the month, will be able to come up with the minimum payment to the IRS, which is, you said that the length of a, the maximum length of a payment in chapter 13 is five years, which is 60 months. If you divide $300,000 by 60 months, that's $5,000 a month. If this person who cannot afford to pay right now $300,000 to the IRS or the state, or even $50,000, but can prove to a judge, a bankruptcy judge, can come up with $5,000 at the end of every month, will be able to file chapter, sub, chapter 13 just for that. They're not seeking to wipe out any debt. They're just seeking a payment plan, in essence. They're using it as a payment plan over five years. Yes, not everyone's looking for a discharge. That's a perfect example of something which isn't dischargeable, but you can use the machinery of Chapter 13 to pay it over time. If you do have the ability to make the monthly plan payments every month for the next five years, but you don't have it all in one place, that's absolutely a way that you can resolve the tax debt. That's very similar to another situation. I've had people come in with little to no credit card debt or medical bills, but they, for whatever reason, they got behind in their mortgage. And the bank is saying, you've got to come up with, you know, six or seven or eight thousand dollars in the next week. Well, they don't have that in their back pocket in the next week, but you go into a chapter 13 before the foreclosure sale. The filing of the bankruptcy stops the foreclosure sale from happening. And now you've got three to five years to catch up on what you're behind instead of three to five days like the bank is, is demanding. This is brilliant. And all, how long have you been on the radio talking about bankruptcy? Three years more? Uh, two or three years, yeah. We've never talked about using the machine of Chapter 13 to, in essence, force the state or the IRS to enter into a payment plan with you to repay your taxes over five years. I think we've sort of touched on it here and there, but we've never made such a direct definitive statement on the radio about it. I've always thought in my mind that you file bankruptcy to get rid of your debt. If you are lucky, you will be a Chapter 7 because all your debt that is dischargeable, obviously, will be wiped out. If you're not so lucky, fine a big number of it will be wiped out and then you repay something over three to five years i've never thought that someone who has no debt to wipe out or cannot wipe out the debt like income tax cannot wipe it out i'm sure if you could wipe out income tax a lot of people are gonna want to do it but the law says you cannot i did not know that you can use the chapter 13 machinery to force the government, whether it's the state or the federal, into a payment plan with you. And in the meanwhile, they cannot lien your properties. They cannot do any of that thing. Yes. One of the beautiful things about bankruptcy is your creditors don't get to decide if they're in it or not. You file for bankruptcy. Even you tell the, the court IRS, who you're... Even the IRS. Well, they're a creditor, aren't they? They don't get to decide if they're in it or not. You file for bankruptcy. Well, you tell but, the bankruptcy court that, who your de creditors are. But then the government, nothing stops the IRS. We all know that. 
Well, they can't say that you're not in bankruptcy and they're not one of your creditors. So if they want to get paid, they have to do the same thing all the other creditors do in a Chapter 13 to get paid. They still have to follow the rules, even if they're the government. Well, they're the government, and the government has also enacted the bankruptcy code, so it all must be consistent. I understand that. Um, just very quickly remind us, we have less than one minute remaining. When your income taxes are older than three years, and during that year for which you're talking about income tax that you have not paid, you had filed your income tax return on time, you can file bankruptcy to, to seek to have a discharge. That applies to both IRS tax and state tax or no? Either any level, any level of income tax, it could be city income tax, it could be uh, state or federal, any level of government for income tax. And turn Michael Bankstein, like always, such amazing golds of nuggets. Thank you so much. We hope that. Thank you so much. You know, this is the highlight of my Friday talking to you guys about this and talking with you, Jumana, and you, Rami, about these things. Thank you. You guys have a great day. Thank you. Thank you to all. Have a wonderful weekend, Rami. Thank you.